five months ago I found myself on a bit of a merry-go-round and that would be having a bit of success. So as an 18 year old at Old Trafford winning, winning the grand final, picking up an injury, going on a long stint of rehab and then going back round again. And that has been the, the curve of my career so far. And I've all of a sudden had a realisation that I need to vent my drive and focus into something else. And that's what mentality is. So in this, I'm going to find successful people, completely pick their brains for how they go through life and how they determine what they're going to do and how they make the next steps and mainly overcome fear to do something special. Today I've got the absolute pleasure of being able to delve into Colin McLaughlin's mindset, ex-SAS sergeant and star of SAS Who Dares Wins. Colin, let me just find out what you do on a morning. What is your morning ritual? And have you, have you, has it, has it got any better? Has it got any worse since you left the SAS? I guess uh, for every morning you get up, and it depends on the environment, and your state of mind, and uh, for me. I, I try not to have rituals because those type of things, if you miss it one day, sometimes that can affect your, your, your mindset and stuff. So, no, I, I, get, I get up and I remember what I'm doing for the day and generally just try and set those little mini goals that get you through those little things that I've got to achieve today by the time I wake up tomorrow. Um, there's one thing that I've started doing very recently um, and that's to make my bed. I, um, f for years and years I've not made my bed, I never thought it important, but they say that if you accomplish one task at the start, start of your day, and this you've you probably heard this, that you're on your way to accomplishing a lot more going on. Is that something you do? Yeah, it's a good point. I think a lot of people say that your your mental state and, and your goals and stuff, a lot can be replicated by your surroundings. So people look at someone's house, their bedroom, their bed, and that's almost a direct relation to how their mindset mm. is. So if they get up in the morning, they make their bed, they you know they set their stall out for the day it's almost that's their kind of path and their mindset you know yeah. and it's organized and there's a clear set and little things like that just they, they make a lot of difference i mean you've probably been asked this so many times before what is it how did you get recruited for the sas and and what did you have to go through i mean we've seen on, on the television show that the the, the, the ring were all that you have to go through but to get to that stage how how do you get to that stage to be selected yeah so it's it, I think what people forget is that you're a volunteer, so you always start off in the in the military, whether you're Army, Air Force, Navy, and then you, you volunteer. You put your papers in to say, I want to try SF selection. Um, and you'll go on some kind of SF uh, prep course. But a lot of that's mindset. You want to be the best you can be. So whether you're you know a young kid throwing a ball around and you aspire to be in the lead rhinos or whether you're in the, the army and you think one day I'm going to be in the special forces, you, you set those goals and you work towards them. I imagine like every SAS member would have to be a leader. Um, so obviously you have different ranks and stuff but I imagine everyone would have to be a leader in some sort of way. What, what, what defines a leader to you? Yeah, it's a good question, and uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Every single member within that within that team is is a leader just by definition, and they all they all bring different uh, mindsets and different skills accordingly. And we tailor every single mission we do depending on the individual's skills. So we might need a a medic or a demolition or a sniper or a linguist. So it's it's kind of similar to that. For me, leaders are, are people that can bring out the best in everybody as a team. And that, that encompasses a whole load of things, leading by example, making big decisions, um, you know, communications, the, ho the, whole, the whole nine yards, exactly what it takes to be a, a captain out in the field. Right. And, and obviously tailored into that, there's, um, there's the element of fear. I mean, you guys will, you guys will you know, have a, have a massive different, difference in fear and, and how you deal with it. Um, I suppose it's relative to what what everyday people go through, you know, in life and making decisions and and worrying about about what to say or what to do. How do you how do you deal with fear? How do you treat it? And and how do you overcome it? Yeah, it's a good question. I think I, my my first piece of advice for that would be that always remember that you're the gatekeeper for your own emotion. I can't make you sad or angry or happy. Only you can do that. So no one can control my emotions. Only I can control that. So it doesn't matter what happens on the outside world. I'm always ultimately the gatekeeper for how I feel. And that's important because once you realize that you've got 
ownership of your own emotions. It's easier to control. And we're human beings. We we get scared as the same as anyone else. I hear those lead wasps flinging past my ear and I'm as scared as anybody else. The difference is I then can manage it and deal with it. Colin, obviously you spoke about um, when you got captured in, in Iraq. Um, is there a sort of vision that, that you've got there as, a, as like either the scariest moment for, for what you had to go through in, in that? Yeah, I think a lot of people say when you were captured, I take it the point where you were having those mock executions, that was the scariest. And bizarrely, for me it wasn't. For me the scariest part was when order broke down. So while somebody was in charge and he was telling people what to do, ironically, I felt safer. When they started fighting between themselves and it was a mob mentality, that's when I felt most vulnerable because it was kind of all bets are off. I could be kind of torn limb from limb. So they were kind of, they had no, they had no order and they, were, they, they could decide what, what to do really, Absolutely. I guess. Absolutely, yeah, and that's, that's mm. when I felt the most vulnerable. That's the, probably the point I was most scared at that point. And these mock ex executions, did they have a gun to your head and did they pull the actual trigger when, when they did them? Yeah, so at that, at that point I'd be naked, blindfolded, handcuffed against the wall. My compadre was in the room opposite. I could hear what was going on there. And then every now and again they would just press the trigger. Um, and I think the first time I would assume that it was, that the weapon was faulty. After it happened a few times, I kind of clicked on it. it was what what physical feeling did you get and like what what thoughts ran through your head when when that happened you you almost force yourself to think about things that you think you should be thinking about so right. family and the person next door and for me um i always thought about the guy i was with because i was the commander on that mission and i was responsible for the guy on the other side so even though i was you know scared about my own life i was always conscious there was a there was a guy next door and i was responsible for him and that was always at the forefront of my mind as it is out there you're responsible for the guys under you don't want to see anyone get hurt so you you know you want to keep that you want to keep that core so a very selfless selfless thoughts really and because yeah. and you were obviously a sergeant and stuff you kind of felt like you had a role to protect him absolutely and i think that becomes relevant when there was opportunities to escape because I knew if I escaped I was leaving him behind so that was never really an option for me I wouldn't have mm. been happy uh, getting myself out of there knowing he was still in so um, I stayed there you know and um, yeah you, you kind of got to stand by your your convictions and we, we talked about leaderships that's that's one of the, that's one of those things we had a, a very big um, bit of a spiel from Jamie Jones you can today um, about overcoming adversity and, and and all the different things that goes in with that and obviously your case is a is a massive scenario and something that that a lot of us would never never even dream of or you know think that we're going to be in that position do you think now that you're in such a much of a better position to, to have gone through that definitely I think before you come through a period like that, whether it's uh, stuff going on with the family, whether it's stuff uh, physically with yourself, whether it's stuff you've seen, you, it creates so much strength through that, um, that mental strength that comes with having gone through that. If you've come through that and you've come through, you know, unscathed, you know, you've, you build that resilience and, and you, you see that, you see that in the military. Guys that have done one or two operational tours, by the time they come to their third and fourth tour, they have that physical robustness, they have that resilience mentally. And it's the same with, with, with you know, guys, guys like yourself, JGB, guys that have been, you know, through various different things, that automatically creates this resilience, this kind of attitude that um, you, you can't teach. And obviously the Pilgrim is, is set to come out soon. What kind of themes and stuff are people going to expect in that? Yeah, traditionally you would think an autobiography of a, an ex SES guy would be bombs and bullets and, and stuff like that. This is this is slightly different. My it talks about my childhood and um, the crossover with the the NSPCC and we talked about resilience earlier. You know that you create that resilience through the environment you're raised in. So for me, you know, I I talk about when I was captured in Iraq and you know when I was. Uh, you know, that wasn't the first time I'd been naked and, you know, uh, hungry in a room. I'd been beaten. That that had happened before in my childhood. So it creates that that resilience, that protection that you can protect yourself when these things happen. And it's no coincidence we try and replicate that when we do selection. So we have an interrogation phase, escape and evasion, so that 
it's not the first time it happens to these guys. So that shock effect isn't there, and mm -hmm. we've built a kind of wall to protect ourselves against it. So it's got a little bit of that, and it's obviously got some some almost Billy Connolly type <laughs> adventures in my first unit, Scottish Infantry <laughs> Unit, the Royal Scots. Then it's got some quite high profile operations, as you would expect in the SES, and kind of finishes with all the kind of post life, whether it's security, university, or TV work. Thank <laughs> you.